it looks like it's about noon, so thank you all for coming to today's lunchtime talk in science and math. Uh, we have another one coming up in uh, about two weeks, I think, April 4th or somewhere around the, there is uh, Dr. Leslie Alvarez from the psychology program talking about yoga and meditation, not Yoda and meditation, as I sent out in my previous email address. So, with that, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Estalis, who will be talking some about the planetarium and the observatory and how he spent his last semester. So, let me thank the speaker. I think it's supposed to be welcome, the speaker. There's nothing to thank you for. You're right, okay. Well, welcome you this time. There you go. Um, before I start, I do want to credit this picture. It was taken by Mike Henderson with his quadcopter. We're very thankful. We've got some great shots. Um, kind of almost makes it look like we're out in the middle of nowhere, which isn't quite the case. Also, I do have a uh, sign-up sheet down here for the email list for the Planetarium and Observatory. So if any of the things you see interest you and you'd like to hear about activities at the Planetarium and Observatory, as well as upcoming astronomical phenomena like the uh, total lunar eclipse that's going to happen on April 4th, I send out email notes about those. So you're welcome to sign up after the talk in the, on the list, if you still want to after the talk. So I'm going to open up this talk by opening up the observatory, partly because it's cute, but partly because I've had an awful lot of people say, I walked down the levee behind the baseball and softball fields, I didn't see the observatory. I imagine that's because people think observatory and they imagine a big dome. Well, this isn't a dome. This is what's called a roll-off roof observatory for obvious reasons. And it's got some advantages over the dome. One is, domes typically just have a slit that opens, which means you can have one telescope inside. As you'll see, we have three. Uh, second of all, the other kind of dome that we actually looked at, uh, it's a clamshell dome, so it actually opens up completely. It would give the entire room a full view of the sky. That dome costs $70,000 by itself. 40% more than we paid for this entire building. So uh, yeah, it was a possibility. So to take a look inside, so in other words, when you go to the observatory, don't look for a big dome. Look for a, shat, a shed, basically, a shed. <laughs> inside, you can see we have two research-grade telescopes. You can't really see both. This is one, and that's the other. We cover them up, not in use, uh, in order to keep dust off the mirrors. The, because the roof has to roll off, there's going to be openings to the outside. I think that the builder did a wonderful job of optimizing that roof design for strength and integrity, but you cannot keep the dust out here in the valley, as all of you know. So we cover up all the telescopes when they're not in use. So two 20-inch research-grade telescopes, and then we have a very advanced Mead LX 610-inch uh, that is currently not hooked up to a computer, but it has its own computer in a little hand box. We've also got three telescopes on wheels we can roll out onto the cement pad. The cement pad is there specifically for public viewings and class viewings and things to bring some more telescopes outside to uh, increase the number of telescopes we have available to us during the viewings. And we have a warm room, um, better known as control room to some people. Uh, typically with amateur astronomers, name warm rooms. It's insulated, has a 5,000 watt heater, so in principle it could stay nice and warm, even on those 30 degree below nights. So, the observatory is a fully functional, active place. Uh, we have had over 250 visitors made up of various kinds of groups uh, to look through our telescopes to get tours of the night sky. And the interesting thing is, even with these telescopes that are $50,000 with their mounts, uh, almost all the time, people's favorite part of a viewing is, here's this constellation, here's that constellation, here's a story. Um, they do enjoy looking through telescopes in general, but that's always, in general, the public's favorite part of it is the stories and the constellations work. Uh, interestingly, the only activity at the observatory I actually have pictures of were during the night we got clouded out. There was actually no observing going on here. I was just talking about telescopes and entertaining the crowd. But let me go back a little bit and talk about how we got to this stage, because I do want to point out, we took possession of the observatory building June 5th. We had our first activity at the observatory June 19th. So it was a pretty quick turnaround. And as far as I'm concerned, my sabbatical started on June 5th. And uh, was at least half of the summer's work was sabbatical. Just ask my wife. I was not at home a lot when I should have been. 
So going back a little ways, I wanted to show you this picture of the cement pad because before this was even poured, before any construction had started, I told the builders that this building needs to be aligned north-south because we have to be able to align the telescope mount axis very accurately with the Earth's rotational axis. And so the builder had a, uh, a surveyor come out and lay down a very accurate north-south line. They then built the pad, poured the pad, aligned with that north-south line. And then once the cement had dried, they cut the line down the middle so that it's very parallel to the side. So it's a very good north-south line because once the building was up, one of the last things the contractor did was to put up the piers, bolt them down to those bolts that they had. Now the piers have um, angled slots in them, so we have about a total of 10 degrees of rotational motion so we could perfect uh, or get as close as we could to straight north and south. So I actually got to help with this part. I held a meter stick along the, um, the, the flat side of the base plate there. And then we had two tape measures, one at either end of the meter stick, to measure distance to that center line. And we lined up the piers to the center line. Then when we mount the telescopes, we first put the mount on, and the mount is aligned to the pier. And then the telescope just rides along. So we, we have mounts that are aligned to a pier, that are aligned to a line, that are aligned to a cement pad that's aligned to the line that the uh, surveyor made. Sounds like there's a lot of room for error, but it actually turned out pretty well, pretty, uh, pretty good alignment, and surprisingly good, I thought. Once we had the building, the first thing to do is go out and get a good set of tools, because we need the tools to be able to mount the telescopes and things. The second order of business is mount the telescopes. These two sat in the planetarium for six years. Uh, the one here that's covered, this one here that's not covered, yeah, that one uh, actually was mounted on wheels, but it's not very useful on wheels. It got taken out in that six years, maybe twice. And long enough for me and for the uh, director before me to realize, yeah, you can't really use these telescopes. So this was the first time they've actually been put into use, the telescopes and the mounts themselves. So we got them up pretty quickly. Uh, we had a, which, so the, the tube itself is 140 pounds. And so we, there's, a, there's a dovetail plate that you have to slide it into. For the first one, we got this winch, and we hoisted it up, and we tried to line it up, and holding up all the weight on the winch, tried to get it, it took us probably half an hour. Uh, it was Dr. Adams, myself, maybe one other person. When it came to putting up the second one, just happened to be four guys out at the observatory at that moment, we said, you know, let's just pick it up and try. 30 seconds, boom, right? <laughs> you live and learn. Um, once they're up and on the mount, you can then control these telescopes with a joystick. So this is a picture I took at night. This, was, this is Ben Goldsworthy. He graduated <coughs> in December. He was a, a math major physics emphasis, and he helped me with telescopes for about three and a half years. He's now uh, substitute teaching at Alamosa High School, and he's still helping me with telescopes. But this is a picture of him putting the telescope in the park position with the little joystick that comes with the $10,000 mount. The first couple of viewings we did, that's how we lined up the telescope. That's how we pointed it at things. Which, if you're pointing it at Venus or Jupiter, something fairly bright, that's not a big deal. If you're trying to find some faint nebula or a galaxy, it is just almost impossible to find faint things. So we, we kind of struggled through just looking at bright stuff the first couple of times. Uh, later in the summer, we got the computers. Now, this is, just I actually just made this, what? this weekend or Monday or something. Um, this is one of the computers. It's hooked up to control that telescope. So we're in the warm room looking out the window at the telescope. This is the planetarium software that shows what's in the sky right now. All the stars, galaxies, everything's up there. And this little yellow bullseye you can barely make out, that's showing me where the telescope is pointing right now. Now it's hard to see, but there's a red bullseye right there. I pointed at one object, a particular star, clicked on it, and it puts a red bullseye there, as in that's my target. So as I hit uh, record on the camera to make the movie, the, uh, I hit record, my wife clicked slew, and this is what happens. Watch the yellow dot and the telescope. As the telescope moves, the yellow dot shows me all the time where the telescope is pointing in real time. So even if it's at night, and it's completely dark out there, which it should be if I'm taking pictures or something, I know where the telescope's pointed all the time. That made it a whole lot easier. 
Now, the very first time, we, we put the telescope up on the mount, we got the software set up, and the very first time I say, salute to this double star. Telescope salute and said, there, we're there at the double star. I look in the eyepiece, there ain't no double star. Well, that's to be expected because we just kind of line things up by hand. And it's not perfectly aligned with the Earth's rotation axis. Uh, the, the polar axis is maybe a little too low. So you expect it to be off a little bit. With this software, all I had to do was find that double star and center it and tell the computer uh, we are there now. It's got a function that allows me to select stars and add them to an alignment list. So I say, okay, let's add this star to the alignment list. It slews to it, says I'm there, and I look through the eyepiece and, you know, we're not there. I, I center that by hand and hit enter when it's centered. And we go through this after, this is the first one, you didn't see anything in this in the field of view. On the second one, the thing I was looking for was in the field of view, but not nearly centered. So I centered. By the third one, it's pretty much centering things. So it's learning as it goes what the actual offset is to the real sky. So in a sense, it's got this map of the sky where it knows things are, and it thinks it's lined up with the sky, but it's not because the mount itself is not perfect. This software has this function that allows me to make this list. When the list of alignment stars is above, I think the number is 50, I did 60. So 60 alignment stars all over the sky. You can then run a special function in the program that does a sophisticated statistical analysis. It develops a very accurate pointing model for the telescopes. Now, to understand the accuracy, you need to know. There's 360 degrees in a circle, right? Break each degree into 60 minutes or arc minutes. Break each minute into 60 seconds. We were getting, after I did this twice, I think, um, we were getting pointing accuracy on the order of 10 to 15 arc seconds. So if you're, say, looking at the moon, it's not point the telescope to the moon, it's which crater do you want to see? In fact, it's actually better than that. For a lot of the craters, it's which side of the crater do you want to be pointed at? That's the kind of pointing accuracy we're talking about. <coughs> the interesting thing is, once you've done that function, you can then ask the, the uh, software, what do I need to do to make the alignment of the polar axis of the Earth, the rotation axis of the Earth, better? And it'll tell you. It'll say, raise the polar axis by 30 arc seconds. <coughs> and in fact, this is the uh, paramount that it's mounted on. And you can see this pole right here has got a, a um, screw handle on it. That actually controls the elevation of the polar axis. This is the polar axis right here. That should be pointed parallel to the Earth's rotation axis. So when it says raise the polar axis by 30 arc seconds, it'll also tell you, turn that knob. That knob has little neurals on the edge. It'll say, turn two neurals. It'll tell you exactly how many little bumps you have to rotate. It's amazing, the kind of precision. If I got a better picture, you would see the little um, Sharpie marks I put on the thing to mark, okay, here's where it's at, here's where I'm going to, so I can do this as precisely as possible. And it's uh, tedious, but the pointing you end up with is amazing. So these two movies just show the rotation about the two different axes. First of all, first of all, find the mouse. This is north-south. So this is rotating about the axis that's holding these counterweights. And yeah, that's motor noise. And this is just being done with the joystick for the sake of the movie. So we can go north-south, that's called declination. And... Oh. Hello, where's the mouse? Yeah. There it is. <laughs> and then this is rotation about the polar axis. So as the Earth rotates and the stars and things seem to move through the sky, the telescope has to move at exactly the right rate to keep them centered. And it does a pretty good job, but no mount is perfect. No motors are perfect. And so if you take, if you put a camera on here, you take a picture and you open up the shutter for say 10 minutes, and it's just moving at its sidereal rate to try to track the stars, you're gonna find those stars actually have drifted and they'll, you'll get streaks in your picture. So what we can do is take a second camera and put it on a little tiny camera and put it on this telescope. And then that same software will watch the guide scope now It'll find, you can actually tell which star, tell one star to use as a guide star. And then it zooms in on that, the image of that star. And that star probably takes up 20 pixels in a circle. And it will watch those pixels, and it will send commands to the mount as needed 
to keep that star centered in those pixels to within a fraction of a single pixel. It's amazing. As soon as you get the tracking, it's called auto guiding. As soon as you get that going, you can do 20 minute exposures. <coughs> And that's, that's also working. Uh, this is that other telescope. The mount's a little bit different. These were called German equatorial mounts. This one's a fork mount. But the fork that the telescope is resting inside, that's what's pointing at the North Celestial Pole. And then it can rotate this way for right ascension or east-west. Then the telescope tube itself uh, rotates on that axis for north-south. Very different kind of mount and has its own limitations. These telescopes on the German Equatorial, they can't cross the meridian. They can't follow a star as it goes from the eastern half of the sky to the western. Once it gets into the western half, they actually have to turn all the way around and then start watching again. This guy has no problem with east to west, but it can't really find things around the pole. It has a lot of trouble finding things around the North Pole. So, both kinds. This is also a nice view of the current interior. We've got a great workspace. This is the telescope room, the roof that rolls off. We've got the workspace. We got storage space. This is a um, AV cart, which is great for getting the pieces of the camera you're going to put together and mount on a telescope, and then rolling out to the telescope to put it on. You got to remember when you're putting a camera on the telescope, you've got to put in bolts, and it's four or five feet high. And if you drop something, or if you need a tool and it's not handy, that's that's a problem. So the cart is used to kind of roll equipment out in order to mount it on to the telescope for easy. Inside, uh, we have lots of storage space. We have a big work table, two control computers, a microwave and very comfortable chairs, <coughs> good speakers, a heater. It is not uncomfortable to spend the night at the observatory observing. We have a great library of books that tell us about what's up in the sky, where to look, descriptions of how to do these things, how to observe planets, how to photograph, and really all that stuff. So we have a wonderful uh, facility. I've had professors, the uh, directors of the observatories from Western State College and um, Fort Lewis College here. And they are envious, if nothing else, of our warm room. And uh, some, to some extent, the equipment we have is better than any they have. I've had students, <coughs> astronomy students from the University of Colorado here, and they are also envious, partly of our dark skies, but also the equipment that we have. When we're actually working at night, this, I'm taking pictures, say this is what the monitor is going to look like. So, all I have to do to take pictures uh, or, or do other um, projects is go outside, open up the roof, uh, hook up the camera onto the telescope, and maybe both cameras if I'm going to do guiding. And then once that's set up, I can go inside and sit down at the desk and I can do everything from inside. I can point the telescope, I can focus the telescope with this software, I can set up the auto guiding, and then this is the software that actually takes the pictures. So that's the software that's talking to the camera that's taking the photographs that I want to take. And basically, I could then spend hours um, just taking pictures. You do have to refocus every so often because as the temperature changes at night, the focus is going to change. You want optimal focus throughout the whole session. <coughs> but that's what it's going to look like uh, when you're actually making use of them. Now, when you take a picture, uh, an astronomical photo, it is not like your point and shoot. You don't just put a camera on the telescope and point at something and uh, you probably actually need to program. You actually take lots and lots of pictures. Here we go. And then you stack them and you do lots of other processing. I'm just going to demonstrate the stacking because I keep forgetting this is split screen. Can move this over to your screen. Hey, <coughs> all right. So this is free software called Registax. And you use it to <sighs> What's the problem? Oh, it is slow. Okay, once again, the split screen just really screws me up. Here we go. So I've got all these pictures of the moon. This night I took 20 photographs. There we go. Select them all and open them. Okay, so here we have 20 pictures of the moon. I am going to look at a crater called Copernicus. There it is. Okay, so this big crater here has got lots of nice features, but you can tell looking at this picture that there's some fuzziness to it, right? The 20 pictures are going to help. The software is going to do sort of a statistical analysis as it stacks them 
and it'll bring out a lot of detail you can't see in any one picture. Now, the other problem is, this is the first one, let's scroll through, watch Copernicus. There was drift between the pictures. So it really can't just take the pictures and stack them. It cannot do that because the creator's not lined up from one picture to the next. So the first step is going to be to align the pictures so we can do the stacking. So first thing we do is set the align points. I'm just going to go with everything that's uh, by default. I don't need, except for this, I don't need that many align points. I'm going to drop it to, yeah, that's probably more than we need even. But there you go. We've got a bunch of points it's going to use to align the pictures. Let's do the alignment. And it just takes a minute. Here's a, a bar down here that tells you how much it's done. There we go. Now they're all aligned. What limit does is I've got 20 pictures. It'll throw out the worst 20%. And you can actually set that as well. So I only keep the best 16 pictures as far as sharpness. Okay, once they're aligned, it's time to stack them. Again, I'm going to leave all the defaults. This takes a minute or so. Um, and now it's going through all the pictures and doing this statistical analysis to try to bring out some detail that we wouldn't see otherwise. Yeah, of course. And what you're going to see when it's finished is it doesn't really look much better than the original. <laughs> but then, okay, so we did a line, we're doing stack, the last tab, the wave <coughs> tab. So keep in mind, you can holler at me if I don't notice that it's finished. Um, the wavelet tab is the one where the magic's done. Okay, so let's go back down to Copernicus, a little further here. There it is. Now, I am going to, first of all, I'm going to double click to tell it to work on this part. It'll show me a preview of what I'm doing. I'm going to overdo this. This is really as much art as science, trying to figure out exactly how much to adjust these, these levels. This slider will do the wavelet analysis on a fairly large scale. So I'm going to crank it out to eight. Now watch Copernicus crater. Mm -hmm. See that sharpness pop out? Mm -hmm. This wavelet analysis is some crazy math that I've never bothered to learn. <laughs> now these go on smaller and smaller scales. Typically you would be very gentle with these and make very small adjustments. I've never been much of an artist. Uh, and I just want to demonstrate anyway. So once you've got this where you like it, and you just click, do all. And it takes off and it runs around the picture, updating. I probably already missed it. Yeah, it's already gone through that part. <coughs> well, if we just watch, you'll see it go by when it, uh, as it's doing patch at a time. Now, typically, this is not the only thing you would do either. If you're going to take a picture of a nebula or a galaxy, you want it in color, you're going to take 10 to 20 pictures with a monochrome camera through filters, red filter, green, blue, and luminance. There you go, it just sharpened up. And then you're going to do the stacking for each of those individual ones. Then you're going to use software to combine them into one picture. And then you're going to go into something like Photoshop and do post-processing where you tweak the colors and make it look even prettier. I can do full image. That's it. And you see how sharp the details are in here now. So what I want to get across, I, this is not a course in using Registax, I am definitely not an expert in processing astrophotos. Um, but what I want to get across is that going out to the telescope and taking pictures is not the whole job. Maybe not half the time, but almost as much time is spent processing as it is taking the pictures. And you might take those 60, 80 pictures to get one photograph. So it's a lot of work to get one good photograph, which I haven't got yet. But that's, what's, that's what lies in store. Um, come October, that's about where I was in October. And at that point, the fiscal year, federal fiscal year was over. My funds were frozen as far as buying new equipment for the observatory. So I shifted my focus over to the other part of my uh, sabbatical. And that was creating a fractal movie, a movie about fractals for the dome, for the planetarium. With the goal of distributing it to planetariums all over the country. Of course, with Adams State University's name pasted all over it. Uh, and so I've been playing with fractals for years. And by years, I mean on the order of 30. It was in the 80s I started playing around with fractals. Um, and I've always loved playing with them. If I were to add up all the hours I spent in front of a computer zooming in these different fractals, I'd be ashamed to think about it. But, um, there is one particular one I'm not going to demo for you, but it's free as well. All the software I use is free. Um, that allows you to make movies. It allows you to change the scale from one frame to the next. It generates all the frames. 
and then you can use some other software to create a movie of it. So part of the fractal movie is going to be things like this, zooming in on fractals because they're really cool. This zoom was actually made for the dome. So imagine a circle, and that's projected up on the dome over your head. It's, it's really impressive in the dome, especially with music in the background. I don't have music for my movie yet either, but we're getting there. The whole movie is not going to be these zooms. There's also going to be quite a bit of explanation. I want people to understand what they are and how you create them. One of the definitions of fractals, very obvious, all fractals have in common this idea of self-similarity, which means the whole thing shows up again on smaller scales. So you saw what the whole fractal, that was the Mandelbrot set, what the whole thing looked like, and you start finding them again, little copies all over the place as you zoom in in different places. We're going to end up on one in just a minute. Speaking of creating movies, I have a fantasy, as Matt knows I have lots of fantasies about things we could do here at the school. I would love to see students get involved in creating planetary movies. And this is all free software, it's just stuff I figured out how to use. Students could do this. Uh, create movies that we could then distribute around the country and give the students some experience with that. Unfortunately, I have a lot more ideas about things we could do than we have time to do. Here comes our last Manly Broad set. Sorry about the jerkiness. This uh, PowerPoint's over a gigabyte with all the videos I have, so the computer's struggling. But there you go, another Manly Broad set hidden deep within the Manly Broad set. Now, another software that I've been playing with, or the program I've been playing with since the 80s, is POV. Right? By the way, here are uh, some of the free software that I'm using. Oh, I want to demonstrate. So these are the ones I'll demonstrate. They're very quick and easy. They're all free. If you like the idea of playing around with the software, well, I'll tell you what, actually, this thing's going to be so much. Yeah, I'll skip that. Go look up Fractiv and Zeos on the web and download them. They're free, and they are wonderful little fractal generators. Uh, they make it really easy to zoom in on different types of fractals. OK. The next one I want to talk about, though, is POV Ray. And I've been playing with this since the 80s. This is one of those open source software that lots of people have contributed to. And it allows you to create a universe and populate it with boxes, cylinders, spheres, planes, cones, whatever you want. And there's more advanced shapes you can use as well you can create. It allows you to give each one of them a size, an orientation, a position. It allows you to give them a texture or a color. It allows you to change any of those things over time. So you can make movies very easily. So this is one still scene that I made for the planetarium using POV ray. Now here's one that looks kind of simple. There's three toy trees, there's a sky, there's some cool little <coughs> grass. There is something in here you can't see. It's a transparent sphere. It's in between the camera and the trees. You can't see it because its uh, index of refraction is one the same as air. So when light passes through it, it doesn't bend. Now, I use the, maybe, the movie making abilities of POV ray to create a little movie that's going to change the index of refraction from one up. And it goes quadratically with time, and you'll see what happens. So POV ray does refraction. I've tried making telescopes with this, and so far I've not had much luck. Uh, but it's a neat idea. Now that looked kind of fake. I wanted to show you this little movie because it demonstrates that POV ray is actually fairly sophisticated and can do really good water and sky. If you look carefully, you can see those waves are moving. Now they're not really bending around objects or anything like that. On a large scale, it looks pretty good. And yes, this is a two-dimensional fractal that is just poking out of the water. So next, it would be good to maybe talk about three-dimensional fractals. And I use POV ray to create three-dimensional fractals, and then the movie will explain the replacement process that we use. 
So what we have here is a tetrahedron. Again, this is made for the dome, so it's kind of warped. It's a fisheye lens. We have a tetrahedron. We're going to orbit around it as it goes through a replacement process. This one tetrahedron is going to be replaced by four tetrahedra, each one half the side length of this. And then, a few seconds later, each of those will, will be replaced by four that have half the side length of those. Okay? Now, the... There's no texture or anything because this clip was made as a test. I wanted to try out the orbit that I had designed. It's a mathematical equation. I wanted to make sure it was really an orbit that I liked for the movie. So if you're really just testing out the orbit and the rate of change and things like that, why waste computing cycles on texture and things like that? But you get the idea. The replacement process uh, builds in the self-similarity. So if you look at this, you can see the whole thing looks very much like this or like that which looks like that, which looks like that. And you could just keep on going. If we did this an infinite number of times, you could have infinitely deep self-similarity. Of course, if we did it an infinite number of times, I'd miss class at 1 o'clock. So um, that's about as far as it's going to go. But fractal objects don't have to show an infinite amount of self-similarity. As long as there's some self-similarity at a scale, you know, one or two different scales, then I think it's worth claiming fractal properties. Now, the next... The next shot here is going to be of this, a similar kind of fractal, this time with a cube. You don't get to see the replacement process yet. I'll show it to you on the next slide. Uh, but here we have a Menger sponge. Started as a cube, and we replaced that cube. We sort of divided it up into 27 smaller cubes, and we took some of them out. Then each of the remaining cubes, we divided those up into 27 sections and took some of them. I had to stop at the level I stopped at here for replacement processes, basically, because you get 20 cubes, 20 times more cubes at every step. So the first step, I had 20 cubes. After the second step, I had 400. The third step, 8,000. After the fourth step, I had 160,000 cubes. When I try, and these are the little tiny cubes that, like maybe just the one piece right there, there's 160,000 of them in there. When I went the next step, I had 3.2 million cubes. The computer drew one frame and said, I'm done. <laughs> and, and every computer I've tried, the uh, supercomputers, this new laptop, yeah, they're, they're not doing it. So I had to stop here. Now, working on this movie, of course, it's a movie. I've got to write a script. I've got to have a plan of you know, what's, what's the movie going to contain. But in order to be able to write a script, I need to know what I can do. What kind of things can I create and do with movies with this software? Which means I get to play. And so I would try something. It could be an idea. So I try that. I give you another idea. Okay, so we're orbiting around this thing. Wouldn't it be cool to go through it? Did I get motion sick? This won't bother you as much as it would in the planetarium, I'll tell you that. Now you're going to see the replacement process while we fly through it. This looks really cool in the dark. So when you set up the scene, you've got to check where the camera's at, what direction the camera's pointed, and how it's tilted. So to make all these turns, I had to go through and, and basically figure out a formula to, to point the camera the way I wanted to point it in this reference frame, and to make these turns smooth, as smooth as possible. I also, out here, I put the uh, ground <laughs> Put the ground in the trees out there to keep you oriented. <coughs> I thought about making a whole movie of just this, like a roller coaster ride through a fractal. Maybe I'll do that at some point. Maybe some students would like to do it. Okay, so Menger Sponge is cool. The other idea this gave me was as we build the Menger Sponge, as we do the replacement process, it's like we're taking material out of the cube. What if we built a new fractal? out of the material that we take out of that. I call it the inverse measure. So everything that's removed from that goes into our new fractal. So the very start, the very first step is when you're building a measure sponge, it's a complete block. So we haven't taken anything out yet. There's nothing. The first step is to take out those big chunks in each direction through the middle. So you get this. Then for each of these blocks that's still in the measure sponge, you take out another cross thing like that. Then you keep going. 
And the cool thing about this one is it really shows space filling. This, this um, fractal, it's obviously self-similar on lots of different levels, and as you build it, it's taking up more and more volume. That's the volume that's coming out of the Menger sponge. If you think about it, back at the Menger sponge, every time you take out some of the material, the overall volume of the fractal is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And if you really could do it an infinite number of times, I would claim, mathematicians may argue with me, that's okay, that the limit of the volume as the number of iterations goes to infinity is zero. Just like the limit of volume of this thing is going up to the volume of the full cube. Okay, my next thought, you see this, I thought, wouldn't it be cool to move through this? Well, yeah, it would be a neat movie, but that's a little too crowded, so we're going to go through this guy. We're just going to kind of move along the ground underneath it, and again, it looks really cool in the dome. And I think this is one we could probably chart a path through and fly and turn. And it might be a fun one to put into a movie someday. But and I just did this one because it was cool. Now, those people who are paying me are probably wondering, wait a minute, you're supposed to be making a movie. And all you're doing is cool, fun stuff uh, with your computer. And the answer is, Again, I need to find out what I can do so that I can put together a movie that's going to be educational as well as interesting. Um, when people go to a planetarium movie, they want to see really cool visuals. So I need to create things that look really cool in the dome. So I think it's, it's uh, reasonable to spend time on these kinds of things. But at some point, I have to actually start making the movie, right? In order to explain fractals, I need a set. I need a place where some action will happen while the narrator talks. So here's a scene that I created. Um, this is a classroom that does not exist. I made it in the computer. Um, the, the camera's gonna start here and then move through the desks toward the chalkboard as the narrator is saying, let's go back to school and learn about a type of number called complex. And then at the board, he's gonna talk about complex numbers and how they relate to the Mandelbrot set. Think the volume is up. For example, when we add complex numbers, we just line the arrows up head to tail, and then draw in the sum to complete the triangle. When we multiply them, we simply add their angles from the real axis and multiply their lengths. Can we recognize the area? Squaring a complex number means doubling its angle and squaring its length. David Bonson is his name. He took astronomy from me, and when I thought of him narrating, and that's all the math we need to draw the Mandelbrot set. Thought, no way. Can we to do determine it? if a particular point is in the Mandelbrot set, we repeatedly square it and then add the original number to it. When he read for me, he sounded like data. <laughs> now square that and add the original number. So I said, yeah, gotta have to. He's, he's actually square that and add the original <coughs> number again. As this simple process is applied over and over, most points will lead to larger and larger numbers, which wander away from the origin. Some, however will lead to numbers that stay small. These are the numbers that make up the Mandelbrot set. We shade these points black. The color comes from those numbers that are outside the set. We color those based on how long it takes before we know they're wandering away. So there's still some editing to do. There's some breaks that are probably a little too long. Um, but this gives you an idea of the educational part, the part where we're actually going to be talking about the mathematics of fractals. And there's going to be music in the background that'll help it be a little more alive during these parts. So the Mandelbrot. 
Hildebrand set is the set of points that do not wander away from the origin under the repeated mathematical operation of squaring and adding the original number. So this is not going to be just an entertainment movie. This is going to be an educational movie where people learn a little bit of math. Um, here's another scene I created. It's a, a study, if you will. And uh, yeah, there's fractals all over the place. The camera, again, is going to start here and then move up to the desk and turn and look down at the desk where we're going to talk about two-dimensional fractals and more properties of fractals like uh, the dimension of the fractals and scaling and things like that. We're going to talk about the Koch curve. We're going to talk about the Stravinsky carpet. And we're going to talk about... We're going to talk about fractal planning. And because we control the angle of the branches of these fractal plants and the lengths of them, I thought it would be kind of cool to animate changing those and see. You get different looking plants. So you can imagine these tall trees on the African Serengeti. And then as it gets bigger and more full, you can imagine other types of trees. <laughs> and again, you can see the self-similarity on lots of scales here. There's, I don't know, 13 or 14 levels of repetition here. Now, when you make a tree with this process, it looks very regular, which doesn't look very realistic. If you saw a tree like this in the background of a movie, something in your subconscious probably would register that that's just fake. You got some fake background. Because this is all done with math, why not throw in a little bit of randomness? We can throw in just a little bit of randomness on the lengths of the limbs as well as the angles of the limbs and get something like that. Which, granted, it's still not perfect, but it's certainly a step in the right direction. This looks more like a plant that's been haggard by weather and animals and things. Now, if we're going, oh yeah, one more thing we can do in here. Because we control the angles that these limbs are at, if we put in an oscillating function into the angles, we can simulate, I thought I said a lot of these videos we can simulate grass being blown in the wind, or a tree that's being blown in the wind. Probably need to speed this one up to look a little more realistic, but. There's an awful lot you can do when you control everything about it mathematically. Now, trees on a desk, two-dimensional plants on a desk for one thing. It would be nice to go outside and create three-dimensional fractal trees, which by the way, that's a fractal plant back there I put in the corner for fun. Uh, but let's go outside and build, my automatic things are not going automatically. Build a three-dimensional fractal tree, starting with the trunk and then starting to add limbs. And at first it looks kind of stupid, a little too regular. But as you get more and more branches in there, actually starts to look pretty good. Throw in some leaves. That was good, huh? <laughs> and it looks even better. Now there's a small one down here, shorter limbs, longer or bigger angles, and it ends up looking more like a bush. Then I decided to add just random, I'm just going to throw in trees that have been made with random lengths, random angles, random colors for the leaves. We build a fractal forest. This is actually the closing scene of the movie. And as the camera rises above the forest and we see these mountains in the background, the narrator is going to be saying, even mountains, rivers, clouds, they all have fractal properties. And then he'll go on to talk about how all this was made with free software. Go out and check out this software and start your own fractal explorations. And that'll be the end of the movie. So with that, I am going to close it up. <laughs> you don't get any better. Uh, and say thank you very much for being here. Do you have any questions?